The great thing for me is two Toms. We, we've been asked to do a kind of two Ronnie's opening, but I don't really know how that goes. To be honest, the younger members of the audience, that won't really land with them, Tom. No. So we, we, good night from me. Yeah, and we can do that at the end. Good night from him. Too late. It's, it's, Too late. It's, it's exciting. I know what it's like to have a book that you've been pouring your sort of heart into for several months, and finally it's about to hit the shelves. And I, I'm someone I'm blessed to have the, the get asked to see things up front sometimes to, to give a comment or whatever. And I have to say that this book is a really fantastic book. It's, it's something you. which a lot of people say this because it's true, which is that you wish you had the book when you were younger. And um, boy, that's true. When I started teaching, I, the guidance that I got about behavior management was woeful. And it was definitely single swim and struggling. And I kind of sunk, <laughs> basically. And then I worked out how to do it later. But after years of pain and anguish and feeling yeah. that I was terrible. And, um, and to be honest, with you, later on as a senior leader, like working things out, not getting it right, making a hash of it, it's a tough business. And you're, you're the person to write the book. And it is, a, it, is a, it is a really special book. So before I ask you specific questions about some of the things you put in, just, just give us a kind of overview of kind of why you wanted to write uh, Running the Room, why you called it that, and, and yeah. what you're trying to, who, you're, who you're writing for. Thanks, Tom. Um, it, it's a real labour of love. You know, this was, a, this was a book that was been inside me for, for many years. When I started to teach a bit like yourself, um, I was rubbish. <laughs> it was terrible. You know, I was full of enthusiasm and compassion, but then it's not about compassion. Um, and I didn't know what I was doing. And it took me a few years to realise that, that there were things that you could know how to do. It took me a few years longer than that to realise that some of these strategies and habits and aptitudes of behaviour management were things that could actually be communicated and, and transmitted. And I remember after about three or four years of teaching, kind of looking back and thinking, you know, did I miss the lesson? Where, where was that? And one of the things I found, I mean, I'm going back to about 2003 now, was that the, uh, the training for teachers was really weak when it came to behaviour management. Now, this isn't an enormous dig at the, at the ITT. Well, maybe it is, but it's not meant to be. At the, at the hardworking professionals in ITT, there's many people doing the Lord's work out there. But I just found that myself and for too many other people, the idea was that you'd pick it up as you go along and there would be like a process of osmosis. Um, and that's just not good enough. You know, as I, as I frequently say, let's not train airline pilots like that. And, and there are things you can learn about managing rooms and so on. And, and the reason why I called it running the room, and I think it's something I mentioned in the book, is it's a phrase that goes all the way back to my days running clubs in Soho, which I mentioned far too frequently, and, and that when you're running a club, you're running the room. And it's not just about making sure you've got enough beers and cocktails and staff and, you know, and so on. It's about managing the whole environment. And the room's like a Rubik's Cube, if I can just stretch this metaphor. You know, you change one bit and it changes everything else. And, and, and I noticed then that people act very socially rather than just individually. And all these things made sense in the classroom years later. But as you say, it's kind of the book I wish I had still when I started. And I've always wanted to write it. And all I can say is that because of COVID, it forced me to sit down and write the damn thing. Because um, normally you'd be out being busy working in other places. So I hope, and I think I have managed to encapsulate everything that I wanted to say in it. So and I, one of the things I know about you is because you do, you, you do behaviour management training in schools. And, and one of your courses is about, say, running the school like the, at the system level. Mm. And the other one is about the room. So is the book really for teachers to kind of do stuff for themselves, kind of in their own yeah. space to the extent they could control? Or is it also a kind of book for leaders to, you know, set up whole school systems? Right. I mean, I wrote a, a report a couple of years ago for the DFE called Creating a Culture, and it was really focused on what can leaders do to, to provoke behavioural change in schools. And I wrote that because before that, I'd written a report on teacher training and behaviour management and why it was so poor and what we could do about it. And I think there's loads that teachers can do to, 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 to promote and direct the behaviour in, in their classrooms to make them calm, safe, dignified places. I have to say, though, that the biggest lever in a school is going to be leadership because that then promulgates that culture throughout the entire school. But this is a book which is targeted at teachers because it's not enough just to say, oh, well, you know, if the leadership's poor, what can you do? There are still a lot of great things you can do. And I, and I, and I wouldn't ever want to teach helplessness to a teacher. I think there's lots of things you can do to create structure, order, dignity, and sense in your classroom. I would suggest that the book, it sounds like a sell, but I would suggest that the book is probably about 45% um, 
universal that it, taught, it it speaks to classrooms and schools and leaders and staff could probably get you know equal amounts out of it. I think fifty five percent is targeted very much at the at the, at the classroom level. Um, I, sh I should probably mention at this point I am actually writing the running the school book now for leaders. Uh, okay. so that's, that's a plug for twenty twenty one. Because I think I think it's important, isn't it? Like there are stuff you can do if if you're in a school where you that like you might be critiquing the systems that you work with or hope they wish they were different. You, there's stuff you can still do and that, I, I think that's where this book is great because there are really specific things and I, there's some what I think is important for me is that the t there's a tone there which I think you've obviously crafted which is you're kind of not just sort of stroking everyone saying you know guys it's not nothing to do with you you're kind of saying no come on and you, there's some pretty firm messages in there like you do need to do this and uh, and I there's something about that do you feel like a confidence in in that like you've worked with loads of teachers do you feel that there are things you need to be quite sort of firm about yeah I, no that's a great point there's a tension here isn't there there's, a, there's always tensions in education which is that I go into a lot of schools and sometimes the the leadership will say to me you know fix these members of staff <laughs> you know and there's very much a sense that you know it's the staff that should be running all the behavior and then I go to some other schools where sometimes the staff say to me why aren't the leaders fixing the behavior? And, and at the risk of sounding a bit simplistic, it's, it's kind of everybody's responsibility. There's things that leaders can do at the leadership level to create meaningful systematic behavioral change. There's things that teachers need to do in order to implement those, 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 those strategies. And that if the two don't work together, then, the, the, then you're, you're very lost. And I would suggest that um, while, if you're in a tough school with weak leadership, and you're a teacher, it's tough. It's 10 times tougher than it should be. And, you're, and if you succeed, it's despite the school rather than because of it. But at the same time, there are still things you can do. Otherwise, you may as well just pack up, go home and say, well, what can you do with kids like this? There's yeah. lots you can do. There's lots you can do. And I think this book tries to encapsulate that. So it's great. So we've got, it, it, it feels like it's a book written to, to you know, to, for my younger self and i know a few other people have said that already and it, and that, young dog. which is great honestly it, it's so it's it's so lovely and yeah. in that sense that like you feel like someone is, knows your pain and is trying to help you not feel it it's it's really good well listen, so let, let, let's go into let's go to yeah. some of the detail like so one, one of the, the things that right up the beginning you talk about the model is a kind of what you call the no teach maintain model and i and i wanted to know uh, basically what that means and whether that's just the Tom Bennett School of Behaviour Management that you've de developed or whether you feel there's a kind of evidence around that. So what do you mean by that? The no teach maintain model, what is that? To be honest, Tom, I'm not quite sure what you mean. What is the no teach maintain model? I just yeah, picked three random words from my book. <laughs> it's, it's, well, no, it's like, a, it's like a heading in the book where you said that the no teach maintain. It's something to do with like the principles of... Oh, I see. No as in K-N-O. No, yeah, I said, no, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> K -N -O, yeah. You know, I was thinking, has she got the right book here? Does he think I'm so cowardly? I don't know. Right, okay. K, K N O, like no T. Yeah, yeah. Like, so everyone, yeah, like, everyone loves everyone loves a, a little Trinity, don't they? Okay. What I mean by that, thank you, is that um in order to, to kind of understand the type of behavior you want to see in your classroom, you've got to know it yourself in the first instance. And one of the things which I thought was, was remarkable about the lack of behavior management training that I and many other people got was that you're expected to kind of walk into the classroom and, and, and just get them to behave. And when you ask, well, how is that supposed to happen? They would usually say something like, you know, well, tell them to behave, which is a bit like, you know, telling robbers not to rob banks or, 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 or you know, fish not to swim. It's, 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 it's much, more, much more complex than that. So in order, before you can tell people how you want them to behave, you have to know yourself how you want them to behave, which means that you have to think to yourself, well, what does good behavior look like? Because it's not a question that many of us ask. We've got a very vague, willy idea of what, what good behavior looks like. So you've got to know yourself. And also you can't be willy about it. You've got to be quite concrete. You've got to say to yourself, right, what does good behavior look like when they're coming into the classroom, when they're leaving the classroom? when they're transitioning between activities, when they're handing their books in, or when the homework's late, what does good behavior look like? So you've got to know that in detail, which requires a wee bit of soul searching and thinking, what do I actually want them to be able to do? Once you've done that, then you have to teach them the abilities and the skills and the aptitudes of the behavior you want them to perform. Now this to me is, honestly, this is the transformational part, which I wish somebody had said to me, you know, 17 years ago, that you have to teach the behavior you want to see. Behaviour is somewhat like a curriculum, which is to say there are things you can know and things you can do. And these are things that can be taught. 
And if you've got two children, and one child is really well behaved and patient and hands in all their homework and says please and thank you, and you've got another child who's 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 who's, who's the opposite, who's rude and you know intransigent and, and doesn't hand in homework and so on. And you might think that the first child, oh, what a lovely child, and the second child, oh, what a terrible child that is. But neither of these children have invented themselves, and both of these children have been created by their own circumstances and experiences. In other words, the child who behaves really well has has had their good fortune and advantage to have been shown these social habits, to have, have them demonstrated and insisted upon in some prior context. It could have been a school, most likely the family home, you know, the family unit, their culture, and so on. Which brings us to another point, which is that the children who lack some of these habits, the children who aren't very good at focusing or waiting their turn, the children who don't think that it's normal to put your hand up and ask a question, well, well then we should teach these, these skills and habits to them exactly as if it was a curriculum. And that once these things have been taught to the children, and I mean t taught, then we need to maintain that. If I could just jump back to the taught thing, we teach don't tell behavior. If yeah. you walk into a class of 30 kids and say behave, five of them will know what you mean and and three of them will do it <laughs> and another five will roughly know what you mean and three of them will try to do it and another five aren't too sure and two of them will try to do a bit of it and five of them won't care and five of them will try to do the opposite you know the word behave is such a is such a kind of thin concept that, that you need to add meaning to it for them you need to make it concrete um, it, it's somewhat akin to saying to a child who can't fly a helicopter, you know, fly that helicopter. It, they're just not going to be able to do it, even if they wanted to try for you. And then maintaining, which is the third part of the, this trilogy that I didn't recognise from my own book. <laughs> <laughs> I caught you out there. What, what book? What book, Tom? Um, right, so that, that, and that makes a lot of sense to me. So you start, you, 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 you do, and that, that process of, of knowing like, what behaviour looks like. Um, one, one of the things, um, I, I guess especially when you're at the beginning of your career, is that you don't even really necessarily know how to des describe it. So I guess there's a kind of yeah. collaborative aspect to that and working with colleagues, and it's not just you're not, you're not flying solo. And that's the same with the maintain. So th th there's so many things I could... I'm just, I just going to dive into some more of these. By the way... I hope you recognise them from your own I'm, book here. So Raise your is here to take your questions. You, I have to say that your, your sort of subheadings are a joy. They're just... Um, they're very, some are very provocative, and then they're, they're, very, they're very memorable. So you, you, you're... You're going to have to suffer recognition. It's like a test. So here we go. Um, <laughs> oh God! What did I say? Well, z zero tolerance is a slogan, not a strategy. Ah, yes. So this, yes. This, is, this is a great one. What does that mean? Zero yeah. tolerance is a slogan, not a strategy. Do you know what? Whenever I get called up with the newspapers, they pretty much only want to talk about zero tolerance. You know, it's a great peg to hang your hat on. And um, the only problem with zero tolerance is that, um, for most, as I said in my book, for most schools I go to, it's more of a slogan or a marketing slogan than an actual policy. And I'll tell you why. When you say you've got zero tolerance for something, it means that you will never, ever permit it. And I've been to a lot of schools that describe themselves as zero tolerance, pardon me, schools, and, and I broadly support the thrust of the attitude. I think, I think it's the right direction to go in. The only problem is, is that as soon as you say zero tolerance, people say, ah, yeah, but what if, you know, what, what, you, what, what if you've got a child with some you know, neurological impediments? You know, how dare you clobber them for not having their homework and so on. And you can very quickly look very, very unfair. And to my mind, rightly so, because if you've got a rule that doesn't permit any exceptions, then you're probably going to have a very unjust rule. So there's that. But when I go to these schools that describe themselves as zero tolerance, they almost always have exceptions. It's, you know, and, and, and I, think, I don't think they realise that there's a, this kind of disharmony between the phrase zero tolerance and what they actually do. I go to a school that says they're zero tolerance. And I say to them, would you, you know, would you give a, a sanction to a pupil who didn't hand in homework? Because, they, you know, they've been hit by a bus that day. And they say, well, of course not, that would be stupid. And I say, well, you don't have zero tolerance then. <laughs> zero tolerance. So Almost zero, yeah. But the second thing I would say with zero, zero tolerance is this, is that, I mean, there are probably some things you want to have zero tolerance for that you, that you would never want to say, oh, well, I understand because. You know, I mean, I've worked in schools where teachers were sexually assaulted by, by students. You know, you want to have zero tolerance for that. You, you, yeah. know, you, you never want to say, oh, well, you got to understand what he was going. No, no. Because yeah. sometimes I find with this debate about these sorts of issues is that you, we, we go for the sort of the very extreme case. So, you know, it, like schools that, that talk about low levels of exclusion or almost... Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. But then if you describe, you know, the, the axe murder scenario, they say, well, of course, we'll do that differently. So that's easy. But a more subtle one is 
Now, in the classroom, are persistently annoying kids, but they're not terrible. They're just mm. persistently undermining, not doing what you've asked, and you've given them a warning and a second warning. Um, it's this kind of issue of whether you give warnings and chances or you say, no, that's it, consequence. That's kind of yeah. the more likely play out for that. So what's your feeling about that? Is, are you more like saying, uh, you know, you've, I've told you and there's a consequence or the chances and the warnings? Yeah, th this is a really interesting one. I go to, I mean, consequence systems are, are, are one of the most common reactive systems that schools have. And as I say, frequently say, I'm very pro reactive systems as long as it's not the entire framework upon which you hang your behavior management. I'm very in favor of the proactive system, which I'm happy to explain later. But the problem with consequence systems is, is that very frequently schools get tie, tie themselves in knots with warnings. C1, C2, C3. So I once went to a school where it got to C7 before any kind of actual consequence happened. Everything was a warning yeah. up to that yeah. point, which means that in a class of 30 pupils, you could have you know, 420, 420, acts of you know, relatively serious misbehavior through a 60 minute lesson and nothing would happen as a consequence. You know? And you can see the kids marking off on a sheet thinking, I've got three more goes here. Now, the, the issue is that when you're trying to embed behavioral systems, I think it's quite useful to have warnings, to remind students you're just about to go off the, off the page here. And I think that using a soft warning system, maybe a C1, is useful to help redirect students back towards the work. But one of the things we know about consequence systems is that children frequently treat them as snooze alarms. And I've been to lots and lots of schools whereby they've, they've cut their C7s all the way down to C1 or C2 before something happens, like some kind of penalty. And the weird thing is, is that the behavior just immediately improves because the children realize they've got fewer chances, which suggests to me that you can overuse warnings. Mm -hmm. And that if you are warning a child to stop doing something that they know they should be doing, that they shouldn't be doing, and there's no major impediment to them not doing it. Well, then it's a matter of choice for them, and they need to learn not to do yeah. it. And if, I usually find, I mean, I mean, we can move on to sanctions now to some extent. That again, I think sanctions are part of a school's behavior management process, and it can't be the only part, but it's certainly a part. But it's certainly one of the table legs. And the good thing about sanctions is, is that the the more you use them rigorously the less you have to use them because children then start to expect them so they are more deterred by them. Now they don't work with every child, but the deterrent effect works across the community. And so that's why I think that I, I, I would, I'm a big fan of very, very low tolerance rather than zero tolerance. And you just bring all those warnings down to maybe one. Yeah. And I wouldn't give a warning to a student who I, who I thought had intentionally broken a school rule, knew they were doing it and didn't care. What's the point of giving them a warning? You know, a, a warning just simply gives them a snooze. If they've done it and it's deliberate and you can tell it's deliberate, then I would move straight on to... Uh, and actually be within point. your power as a teacher to decide that rather than it's the systematic thing saying, I'm not allowed to do this because the system says X. Yeah, well, the, 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 again, the danger here is that teachers can get caught tied in knots by students who say, I haven't had my C1 yet. Yeah. I oh, boy. That, I, 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 that's, you know, I've never seen there for that. It's, it's a <laughs> it, thing. It makes me want to tear what's left of my hair out when I hear that. And I think that, uh, the, and th here's the thing, right? You can explain this to kids right at the beginning of the relationship to say, uh, in most cases, I will give you a C1. And then if I have to repeat it, I'll give you some kind of sanction or consequence. But if I think you've deliberately ignored something that I know you know how to do, or let's say I've given yeah. you, warnings for you, it's my discretion to move immediately to a C2. And, that, and then when, you, and when the kids know that's what you're going to do, that's when they think, oh, well, at least I know it's possible. Whereas when you say to kids, I will give you a C1 or C2 or C3, then by God, they will weaponize that against you. It's, it's interesting, and you know, that, that you've, you said that, in that in, just in that little answer there, you mentioned it's the start of the relationship. So I kind of wanted to ask you this. Actually, it wasn't one of the questions I'd, I'd prepared yeah. to answer. I just think it's come up there that often you hear this and you see it as a bit of a sort of Twitter th throwaway um it's all of, it's all about relationships like that's kind of all you need to say and, yeah, and for yeah. me as a, as a younger teacher i used to find that kind of mantra kind of oppressive because yeah it wasn't happening my year nines didn't seem to like me very much so i felt like my, you know what what do i do about that and uh, yeah. so how do you see relationship building um you know fitting in with your you know this idea of low level you know low tolerance and warn you know only a few warnings how do the relationship yeah. fit into your whole kind of vision relationships have 
for many decades been used as a placebo for behavior management, um, particularly in teacher training, where people training teachers, they themselves aren't too sure how to teach them behavior management. See, it's all about relationships. Because the beauty of seeing that is you've, done, you've just kicked the ball five yards up the road onto somebody else's pitch. Um, it's such a vague, woolly aphorism that it's, it's not wrong, but then it's, it's so gaseous and, and so crepuscular that, that you've no idea what it actually means in the first place. Behavior management is about relationships, but relationships are built on trust, and trust is built on structure, and structure is built on dependability, reliability, and consistency. So you've got to take this really thin concept of relationships and break it down and say, well, what does that actually mean? Children need to know what you expect of them. Children need to know that you will be consistent with them. Children need to know that they can rely on you. You might be the only adult they can trust in their lives, for God's sake. But more than that, the problem with just using the phrase relationships is that many weak school leaders, forgive me for saying this, um, kick the ball over to the teachers and say, you need to build up a relationship with these children and then don't tell them how to do it. Or crucially, don't create an environment where it's possible for them to do it by abdicating responsibility in managing things like whole school sanctioned reward systems or whatever. Now, the big danger here is if you say behavior management all about relationships, then the child will only behave if they have a relationship with the teacher. Yeah. So when the supply teacher comes in, is it okay for them to tell the teacher to F off? You know, or if they meet another adult in the school, can they tell them to get stuffed? because I don't have a relationship with that person. So the child also needs to have a relationship with the school and with their identity as a member of that school community. So you can see already just by examining the concepts here that it starts to get very murky when you say it's all about relationships because that can lead you to some very, very difficult paths. And if I'm honest, I've been to lots and lots of schools where sadly lots and lots of, of, of teachers have been told, you've got to build up a relationship with them, which is a bit like saying, you've got to make them love you. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's not that easy. Like, it's, the, it's the kind of, it's an end point, not a, not a strategy, isn't it? In Absolutely. Fact, yeah. It's one, an one, of, one, of your, one of your things that you lead, that you suggest to sort of, uh, I, I think it's near the end. Um, you've got to hold it a sort of. The best like, bit. I, I, it almost feels like you're kind of, I, I just got to stick this in. One, one of them is this. Uh, humor is the outcome, not the process. And that's talking about teachers trying to use humor. So yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what does that mean? It's the outcome, not the process. I thought that was really interesting. Well, it's kind of an extension of what I've just been saying there, which is that um, many teachers aim directly at the relationship with the pupil. Right? And what we you know, we're not not trying to build up healthy, positive, you know, teacher-student relationships. But the problem is because that relationship is so ill-defined and so woolly, they frequently people aim directly at the relationship, and they, they think it, they think it's 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 what they should be doing. So they'll try to make the students like them. They'll try to make them laugh. They'll try to curry favour with the students. And, and then they fall into so many traps about, you know, playing too many games or giving them too many treats or letting them off with stuff or never holding them accountable for their actions or never calling them out or never challenging them on a missed standard. Um, thinking, oh, well, I'm building a relationship with them. No, you're not. You're teaching them that, 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 that you're not an adult. You're teaching them that you're not the teacher and that you don't mind what they do. And if you don't mind what they do, then nothing they do matters, which means they don't matter. So why should they respect you? But if, but if you do things like hold them accountable for their actions, Tell them what you expect of them. Call them out when they fall short. Show them how to do better. Show, treat them with dignity, but also expect and insist that they treat everyone else with dignity, including yourself. The more you do that, the weird thing, ha the weird thing happens. They probably like you. So the weird thing is that a relationship develops. Yeah. You know, almost despite all that tough stuff. And I'm going to suggest that them liking you is, I wouldn't say it's trivial, but it's, it's of tertiary importance. But the weird thing is that if you do all that good stuff about building up, you know, uh, relationships built and consistency, they probably end up liking you, which is yeah. the, the weirdest thing. You ask a kid who, you know, who the best teachers are in school, they never say the one that lets you off with murder. They always say, you know, the one that really holds you to account. But Definitely. you don't stand with them. They it's care hard about to believe it though. When you're, when you're sort of in a mature state as a teacher and you, you know how to do a new, rather well, start a new class, this thing, you, you, you get that. But when you're being burnt by your, you know, on a cover lesson or... Yes. It's, it it yeah. feels like it's so far away from that, doesn't it? It's like you're a real like, teacher, you know. How, how, how am I going to get those kids to even listen to me? So it is, I like all these things. So 
Uh, another thing, I, I, I think this is so interesting because it sort of alludes to some debates that go uh, on around behavior management. You, you, one of your sections is uh, uh, earlier on in the book is about routines and norms. I love these two concepts. People really need to read the book just to understand what you mean by norms and routines. But one of the, one of the things that comes out of this is you ask this question, do routines infantilize students? Which made me yeah. think, has someone said that to you? Has, have you picked up some people thinking routines infantilize children? And oh, then, Absolutely. I mean, I, to be honest, you know, I've been, <laughs> I've been involved in this crazy game for, 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 for several years now. And I find that in education, when you say anything, it becomes controversial because somebody will disagree with you. And that's fine. You know, as long as you believe that you're, to some extent you're right, then, then you have to just kind of stick with it and, and stick to your guns. Um, I'm frequently told that if we teach students how to enter classrooms, if we teach them the routines of how to go into assembly or leave assembly, or how to behave in assembly, that we're somehow infantilizing them because um, we, we, we we're, we're over monitoring their behavior down to, down to the blink rate and so on. And, but, but the weird thing is that if you teach them the routines for how to behave in assembly or behave in classrooms or transitioning or whatever, many students are deeply, deeply grateful for this because they want to know what they should be doing. And many students are perfectly happy just to jog along with the expectations of the school, but you've got to be clear about what they are. And let's face it, no child is born knowing how to behave in an assembly. You know, you, you know, we're not quite tabula rasa, but we're not, we're not born with these things imprinted on our memories. Somebody has to show you at some point. And if you're a child from an advantaged circumstance where you know roughly how you should behave in institutional settings, well, bully for you, and I'm glad. But if you come from, I, I, I come from circumstances where you're not very used to going into institutional settings and you think it's okay to get your phone out or chat or wriggle or pick your nose or something like that, and you constantly get pulled up and given detentions for it or some kind of sanction, well, then it's up to the school to teach you how to do it. And it's their responsibility to do so. And when you teach people routines, you liberate them. I mean, it, I remember when I was, I was 16, I was learning to drive. I didn't turn around to my driver and I started to say, you're infantilizing me by teaching me this mirror signal maneuver routine. Let me discover it for myself. And of course, it ties massively into this, the, the, uh, the somewhat irrational affection some people have for discovery learning and independent learning, which is to say, um, bad learning because if you are a novice at something if you're not good at something you need loads and loads and loads of direct instruction and hand holding and expert guidance you need somebody to say there's the gear stick there's the wheel there's the mirror don't press that button and don't jump out otherwise you make the mistake yourself as yeah. you get better at it as you get better at the behavior then you can perhaps be allowed more agency and so on but once it becomes systematized and taught and you do it a lot it becomes internalized you just do it automatically, and then your mind is free to think about great stuff like art and poetry and music and, and science and so on. So routines don't infantilize, they liberate. Yeah, I think that's a really important message because sometimes you just sort of cut corners, don't you think, well, I've, I've done it once, uh, I've shown them, and you just want to get on yeah. with things, but it's that, that thinking, no, I just, I've got a, is it a routine yet? Has it become normalized? No. So you, have to, you just have to invest that time. So which, which is one of the things I, I, I these are these are one of the things that I really like where you you're, you're sort of reaching out to someone who might be struggling with behavior management and it's in this uh, section about demand where you're sort of saying no demand it's one of your sort of uh, it, it, it's a really powerful section demand and in there you have this great phrase you say slash away for as long as you can in other words you know you can't solve it overnight but what you've got to do is just keep going and it's sort of this idea that if you're haunted by a class it's really you know you're finding difficult not to feel sort of blamed about that but yeah idea and it's a you know so, no, so i was interested in that you know how how does that this idea of demanding behavior and keeping going how does that fit with sort of should teachers be in that position where they, that's how they feel or should they be sort of getting more help do you think i think that um i mean i used to run the behavior forum for the tes for several years like an agony uncle you know put it on my gravestone and, and, and I loved it and I really enjoyed it because you felt like you actually were doing some good with some people. And it, I never used to forget how it felt when I was a new teacher myself. You literally have no idea how to manage the behavior of a classroom. And as you say, you might work it out over five years, but why should it take that long? And one of the things that I think teachers need to learn is a sense of perspective and a sense of you're playing a long game with students. You will get there if you persist, but it's very easy to lose yourself in the moment. So for example, you walk in and you've got a new class there and you ask the, the kids to, to, to get their books out and half of them do, but half of them don't. And you think, oh my God, they're never gonna listen to me. It's very easy to walk into the classroom the next day and say, 
oh God, you know, they were really awful yesterday. I won't even try today because they were so bad yesterday. That's the point in which you've lost. Whereas if you think, think to yourself, no, I'm going to outlast these, <laughs> these kids. I'm going to outpace them. I'm going to be just more adamantine than they are. Um, I'll wear them down. They're not going to wear me down. I'm going to wear them down. And it's by this sense of expectation. And you come in with the same expectations every day. Now, they won't meet them every day, but you keep that bar high. If they force your bar down, they'll keep forcing it down. But if you keep your, your bar up here, then you've got a fighting chance. So you come in the next day and you say, no, I need all your books out. I need you to be quiet. You persist with that until they stop. They start giving up. They start thinking he's not going to stop asking this. But the minute they see you moving your goalposts, they think, oh, that worked. And once they realize that their strategy of resistance works, they'll keep doing it. You've taught them that you can be shifted depending on how much resistance they offer you. But if you show them that no matter how much resistance they offer, you won't shift, then you're teaching them how to behave as opposed to them teaching you how to behave in a classroom. It's a, it's a simple pr principle and it's a mind game. Because when you're a new teacher or when you're a teacher who's you know, under the lash and the rack, then, then, then it's hard, it's hard to persist. But if you're just aware that you know you're going to get there eventually, it's, it's, it's tremendously liberating and motivating to know that. And I, and I wish more teachers did. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really good, good message. And you've got to keep going. And of course, that's when you sort of, the judicious use of, of sanctions and warnings empowers you to, to, to sort of yes. have that kind of front foot feeling and, and confidence in them. So I want to get into this because it's one of the big con contro controversies of recent times is exclude uh, them all tom exclude them all that's what i say the first I, instance I, I did i did a little sort of uh, word search on your on your document uh, for the word booth and the only time it came up was william booth the william founder booth. of the foundation Aha! salvation army yes we should ban him. now you, you've kind of you've kind of like you, and i know where you, you probably didn't want to give sort of airtime to that whole notion but it's part of this whole oh. thing to do with removal so let's talk a bit about that and I, this is something we should I, I just really made me laugh. So it's, it's in a little footnote. Um, where I you love say, the footnotes. Uh, the book, you say the removal room or whatever it's called, and it's like a little footnote. And at the bottom, some of the words that you've come up with are like the hub, the green zone, the egg, room 38, yeah. the cooler, <laughs> the big house, <laughs> the time big out. House. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, these absolutely hilarious names for um, all these sort of the place you go when you've been sent it. out or removed. So let's just explore this. What, what's your view of the, the need for a removal room, how it yeah. should be run, what it should feel like to be there? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's funny. This is one of those controversies that I walked into, which I, I never even realised would be a controversy, which is, and he, forgive me if I'm going too fast here, right? Just, I mean, stop me if my logic falters. If a student's in a class, if you've got 30 students in a classroom and one of your students tells you to fuck off, right? I'm going to suggest that that's not a good place for a student to be anymore and they have to be sent out. If a student threatens another student or, or threatens you or threatens the dignity of another member of, of, of the classroom, if they persistently ruin the learning of the lesson to the extent that learning isn't happening, you know, things like that, or if they're not being safe themselves, with themselves, I'm going to suggest that the utilitarian common sense approach here would be that student needs to be removed from the classroom for the good of the many. Now, it's not that you wanted them to leave. No, t no teacher starts a school day thinking, I really hope I can bin that student. Every teacher walks in the classroom thinking, I hope we have a really chill day here and do loads of learning. That's what teachers think. Right? So when a student puts themselves in a position where they need to be removed, then they need to be removed. Now, again, forgive me if I'm going too fast here, that means that there needs to be a place to take them. You can give a fancy name to it, but I'm going to suggest a room would be a great name for it. Now, in some schools, they're parked in another classroom, and in some schools, they're sent to, uh, you know, a, a kind of internal exclusion unit, and in some schools, they're, they're sent into a corridor and so on. It's done badly and it's done well, but I, I must have been. Tom, I said to you before, I must have been to about four or five hundred schools now in my career. You know, you you know, you and I get out and about a lot, and I specifically look at schools' behaviour policies, and I always look at their internal exclusion rooms and so on. And I have never seen a room where students are just sitting alone. They're always monitored, always monitored, always supervised by somebody. And they're usually with a few other kids and they've usually got some work to do. Now, yeah. that's my feelings on removal. That's why I hate them being called isolation rooms. They're never isolated, apart from in the sense that they've been isolated from the classroom, but they're not isolated from humanity. 
<laughs> and, right. and also, they're, they're, they're frequently given kind of very high ratio, one-to-one, you know, adult company, which is expensive. And then, you, sorry, go on. No, I was going to say, but do you, I mean, do you feel like there's a kind of a whole spectrum of sort of the, how maybe, I don't know, oppressive they feel or that, do you feel that there's some way you think, oh God, it's a bit, imagine being say 12 in that place and you actually, although you might not describe, you know, do you ever feel like it's excessive in the way that it, it's, I don't know, that you just well, don't, you're not comfortable with it? Put it, way, it could be used excessively, but then anything can be used excessively. You know, a cricket bat can be used excessively. I mean, if, if you, if you were, you know, what kids often say, oh, you know, he gave me a detention for, for, for rolling my eyes or something like that. You know, if, 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 if a kid literally, you know, blinked too fast and they were sent to an exclusion room, yes, that would be over punitive. But, but again, my experience is the vast majority of children get removed from the classroom for telling teachers to F off, for punching a kid, for throwing something across the classroom, or for shouting and screaming throughout an entire lesson. You know, you know it's, not small, it's not small potatoes. And the people that tend to be the most animated against removal rooms, you know, <laughs> I'll choose my words carefully. No, I won't choose my words carefully here. They tend to be people who have never taught in challenging schools. They tend mm-hmm. to be people who have never in their life walked into the kind of school that they would never dream of sending their own child to. You know, they, and, and in their minds, they've got this fanciful idea that children would just be cool and be groovy if you show them love. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that's not the case. I mean, maybe eventually, but love and structure in combination. And so kids need to realize that their actions have consequences. This, I think the logic is absolutely there that, you, that students should have, a, there should be a process. And I suppose that what it then is, is there's, there's, this is the, where it gets quite difficult. And I guess it starts getting into the running the school rather than running the room. So I, I, go, I don't want to go into it too much, but and as a teacher, you want to trust that the students will, be, will, will go to the place you send and that they'll be treated well and fairly and they'll be, and that'll be that. How, how do you deal with this thing? So this is one of the, the nitty gritty things. You've had a, a situation with a student where you might have been personally, you know, emotionally affected by it or, yeah. or, just, or not, but they've gone to the removal room and you're teaching them again tomorrow. Um, you know, what should happen between, so, so that they don't just walk back into your room and you feel like you haven't quite resolved that issue or do you just say, well, I, I trust something's happened and I'm the, the adult yeah, and yeah, I just yeah. welcome them back. How do we no, that, 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 That's a great point. I would suggest that if a child needs to be removed from your lessons, that's a really serious thing. You know, that, that shouldn't just be, uh, oh, no, it's happened again. That's a really serious thing. And there needs to be something uh, which I would refer to as a kind of a threshold moment or a threshold conversation, which has got a lot in common with, for instance, restorative conversations. Um, but, it's, but it's not quite as fancy as that. There needs to be some conversation between the adult and the child where there's, there's a sense of resolution. There's a sense of, here's what you did wrong. Here's why you were sent out. You know, and that you accept that, and that you're somehow penitent. You know, you're sorry, and you express regret. Uh, but also in that conversation, the teacher then can say, "Is there anything we need to do to make this less? Is there something going on? Because this is also an exploratory phase, where you can find out if there's an issue or a problem. Is there some impediment we can remove? Is somebody annoying you? You know, is there something I don't know about? Can I make it easier? Do you know how to do the behaviour? Do you know what the behaviour is? Good, right." I want you back in my lesson. I want you to succeed. I want you to do well. And this is where teachers need to somehow sometimes dislocate their emotional apparatus a little bit. You might have been offended by what the child's done, but if you can extract an apology and maybe there's been some kind of reparation, then it's the adult thing to then say, right, you know, you can come back in the lesson. Obviously within certain extremes. I mean, if they've pulled a knife on you or something, then, you know, that's a very different matter. But without that conversation, all you're doing is simply hoping that they behave. And normally what happens is children come back into your lessons with their own narrative brewing away in their head. Where, you know, the, the self-penned melodrama, where you're the bad guy and I'm the good guy. And you know, and I was just asking a question, and, you know, the world is unjust. <laughs> yeah. And you need, to, you need to rewrite that narrative. So listen, here's what really happened. And if you consider, do we need to take this somewhere else? Do you need to spend a day of my lesson, for example? What else in the, the chill zone or the cool box or whatever we want to call it? So it's interesting. And I, and I, do, I, I think probably in a discussion like this, it's difficult because you don't you need to know the specifics of the, of the system. But I do think this, this, this is a source of, of tension and dilemma that in some bigger schools where, the, where this is, might be happening at a higher frequency, to yeah. f- have that time, to find that time, to have that contact with the student in a calm frame of mind to have that adult conversation isn't always manageable. 
Um, and it just isn't. Or, or you've got several students to deal with. And then you've got this issue of <laughs> teachers saying, why do, why do I going to spend more time with that child so they can be rude to me again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the apology wasn't quite good enough, you know, that kind of situation. So do you, do you feel like, I mean, do you come across that where there's sort of the mechanics of that idealised situation actually I, I kind of get problematic? Yeah, to some extent. I mean, this now becomes more about school management, which is something which teachers have got far less control over. But I will briefly say is that um, I, people often say, that, you know, do I approve of, um, you know, centralised detentions? And I, I think there's very few universals of behaviour management. I think, you know, my answer is usually, well, it depends on the school's circumstance. But if you've got a reasonable sized school with lots of kids getting detentions, I think it makes sense of something which is centralised. But then the setting teacher has to go for some kind of five minute resolution conversation at the end of the day. I'm going to suggest that that's a really good investment of their time so they can so they forego having to go to the detention period whether it's half an hour or an hour or whatever so they get that bit of their life back but they do have to go for perhaps two or three five minute conversations and that that's a good investment in making sure you have fewer of them in the future whereas yeah. if you don't make that investment you're constantly paying the bill for the rest of your career so i actually think you get a dividend of time i think it's a workload plus to invest at the beginning of the relationship that way Right. Okay. Yeah, and I get, I get the sort of, you know, we, we, we're trying to focus really on the thing that teachers can do. Okay, there's, there's so many things I could talk to you about. Here's a couple of things that really stuck out to me that because this is something which I've done myself and now I'm thinking, blimey, like way too often. Uh, and, and you're quite firm yeah. about this. You're, you're, you're saying um, corridors yeah. are not places to sanction and students are unsupervised and therefore not safe. And I've sent kids out, you know, I've done it and into the corridor. Like to, yes. To, and not entirely forgotten about them, but you definitely left them there too long. <laughs> and I've done that, hands up. I have left kids out Sorry. too long yeah. because I just got busy with the lesson and they think, oh, blimey, Michael, <laughs> damn it, he's outside. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So what, how, you can see why teachers do it because it's like immediate respite. Um, of course. Cuts a corner maybe. So what, what, how, what's your message to people on this really? How, how do they resolve that? You know, it's... it's <laughs> It's like throwing a cigarette butt out, out your car window. You know, the problem's gone for you, but the problem's there for somebody else. Yeah. I might develop that metaphor a, a, another day. But the point is this, right? We've all done it. I said you're a terrible teacher, of course. Well, maybe you are. But, you know, I've done it too. Um, and it's, it's, the reason why teachers send kids out to the corridor and then forget about them is because they're not trained sufficiently in behaviour management. And that because there's, they've got so few... Uh, strategies at their disposal. They just, they, they, they grab for the first one they can. You, out. Now, every school should have a removal system. Every school should have um, a, a process in place for when a student's behaviour becomes impossible to manage. I'm going to suggest a few things. Number one, a child should only be sent into the corridor for, for very few reasons. For example, if they're upset and they need to calm down, or you want to have a quick word with them, which needs to be private you want, because you're trying to respect their dignity. You don't want to, for example, tell them off in front of their peers, which is often a very good thing. I mean, not telling them off in front of their peers. So that's the reason you do it. But you to deal with it as quickly as you can. Now, when you're pacing your own lesson, it's entirely right that you, for example, um, make them wait a few minutes for you while you set the rest of the class up. But when they're outside in the corridor, they're unstupid. And again, they're normally stewing in their own juices, thinking what a terrible teacher, or this awful narrative they're creating for themselves. You've got to nip that in the bud. You've got to show them the behavior was unacceptable, but you've also got to show them that you want them to come back in. Now, do you want to come back in? If the answer is yes, get them in as soon as possible. If the answer is no, have them removed. And you've got to make that judgment call yourself. But I mean, I've seen, <laughs> I've seen students time their sendings out to be sent out with other students in other classes so they can fill the corridor with mad, mad abandon. You know, I mean, they're not always Moriarty's, but they're not stupid either. And um, so I would, I would recommend never to do that. I understand why teachers do that. Um, but it's just this yeah. kind of unstructured, blah. Can't that. I think the, safe, the safety aspect there is also key, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I think that's now increasingly on people's minds. But it does mean yeah, it's absolutely. like, so you need to have a, if you're running a room, you need to be thinking, if, if, if I need to do this, what am I going to do? And have that clear in your mind. I, I think I think some of the stuff, and, I, and I've seen you d deliver training on this, and and I, I really like the fact that you don't have like a, an absolute or it should be done like this. You're very keen to get get teachers to build these systems and sure. make them work, and I, I think that's really really important that people see that. There's there's a couple of, of things I just think um, 
uh, I, I love this whole discussion is, is about manners. Because <laughs> it's like, okay, we've got enough, we're trying to run our room. Uh, so if, if, if uh, this has just really tickled me that we, because especially because the heading is manners musteth be taught, because you, you're sort, yes. of, sort of teasing yourself for talking about manners. Now, what I'm, you know, is it, so one of the challenges is sometimes where you might have a sense of manners being a certain way of being, and kids yeah. maybe don't have that from their own uh, way of being with themselves, their friends yep. and their families and stuff, or different teachers might have different sense of manners. Uh, but it's a funny, it's a, it's a great concept, I think, but what, just tell us what you think about manners and what the teacher's role is in teaching them. Absolutely. Well, I mean, one of the, the big things which goes through the whole book is that we teach behaviour. And, 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 and I'm, I'm primarily talking about social behaviour, but we're also talking academic behaviour. And one of the things which I think is, is often undersold in education is this sense of manners. And, by, you know, and I have to unpack that. All that I mean by good manners is treating other people with dignity. Treating other, pe treating other people as if they mattered. You know, and I, think I'm, I don't know if I mentioned this in the book or not, but I spent some time as a teacher fellow at Corpus Christi in Cambridge, Cambridge University. And, and I mean, this was years ago, and I felt massively socially out of my depths surrounded by you know ambassadors and, and the, the great and the good of the uh, academic fraternity and sorority and what i found was that many of them were really really good at making you feel at ease and no matter how senior or important they were they made you feel like you mattered and that was it that's that's when it clicked you know that's what manners is making other people feel like they matter not mm. more than anyone else but matter as much as everyone else and i found that a tremendously dignified way of treating people now, obviously, what we mean by manners will vary from, you know, country to country and nation to nation and century to century. To some extent, you'll have to carve out for yourself what you mean by manners. But there are some universals with regards with manners. Um, as I say, treating other people with respect, uh, keeping them safe from harm, being a good host and so on. And then a classroom. You don't just say, I want you to have good manners with each other. Because, again, that means 30 things to 30 people, if it means anything at all. So the job of the teacher is to create a consistent message about here's how we treat one another in this classroom. Now, you need to make it concrete. You need to show them the nuggets of things they can actually do. The woolly aphorisms are useless. They're worse than useless because you think you're doing something, but you're not. It's like, it's like carbon dioxide. It asphyxiates them rather than nurtures them. So, you, for instance, you teach them, I don't know, hold the door open for the person behind you to say please and thank you, to pass paper along... The, 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 along the row, to not laugh when somebody gets something wrong, you know, to congratulate yeah. someone when they do well, or they've tried to, just little things like that. Role model it, demonstrate it, exemplify it, and insist upon it. And the good thing about creating little concrete markers of what manners are is that you can constantly mention it, you know, like, Jake, you didn't hold the door open for, for Jessica. Could you do that, please? Thank you very much. Tiny, tiny little things like that. And it makes life so much nicer. And it also treats the students that there's a common sense of conduct between them all. It's not saying the manners you have at home are inadequate or wrong. It's simply saying in this room, in this space, this is how we operate. And kids are fine with that. People are very flexible and fluid in their appreciation of different norms. You walk into a library and you know how to behave as an adult. You walk into a bar you know what the norms are of that culture, and they're very, very different ones. But you don't think, this is crazy, I don't understand it. Am I in a bar? Am I in a library? You know, <laughs> once yeah, you've been yeah. taught them. So kids just know once they've been taught, this is how I'm supposed to behave in this classroom. And it's not about absolutes for all time. It's like appropriate for the situation and all sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So one of, the, one of the last things I want to talk to you about is this, um, is, uh, this, this was, for me, really interesting to see. Um, that you, you make this link with uh, Rosenstein's Principles, which is all about instruction. So principles of instruction. Have you heard about Rosenstein's Principles? Apparently there's a, apparently it's, it's quite They're the next big thing. Sort of ideas. You're gonna love them when you find out about them. I know, so obviously, you know, my, I, my eyes light up whenever I see that, because I'm sort yeah, of now on autopilot. But I, I thought it was really good. Huh? But, but the thing, I, you know, I, I bang on about this all the time, as, as people know, but yeah. the thing that I often hear is people put a barrier up saying, oh, but it's, isn't it just common sense? And I and wish. Actually, I you know, when, I read, when I read your section, which people will love this, the behavior management kind of uh, interpretation through the Rosen, and I just thought, it's almost like it was written for this. <laughs> it, almost <laughs> makes, it almost makes more sense for behavior management than for, for instruction. It's, it's so um, vividly clear. But, and 
I don't know if you can, you know, off your, off, your, off by heart. Yeah, yeah, sure, can. sure. I mean, so, you said, thought about manners and modelling and so on. I mean, I didn't just. How, look at how clever is it? What, is it obvious that instructional things and behaviour management things will, will sort of align in this way through Rosenshine? Do you think? To be honest, you know, it took me hundreds of schools and multiple years to realise some of the things which people, some people might say, "Oh, well, that's obvious." And to be honest, I'm happy with that because. I frequently go into schools and I'll say, you know, you should teach them behavior. And a lot of teachers go, yeah, we know that. And I go, good, good. I'm glad. Because, because, because when it, or if they don't know that, they go, oh yeah, that makes sense. That, that just seems obvious. I love that because, because it means it's speaking some kind of truth to somebody on a level which they can appreciate. Um, now, with regards to Rosenshine, I mean, God love a bandwagon, you know, I can't <laughs> just hit you, hit you yeah, my own. As soon as, I, as soon as I realized, he says in his gold palace, as soon as I realized that um, behavior was like a curriculum, all the stuff that people like you and I and many other people have been talking about for the past, say, five to ten years about, you know, cognitive psychology and the science of learning and so on, I suddenly thought, this all applies here. If you want to, I mean, if you want to teach, there are some basic principles of teaching which apply to just about anything you can teach, whether it be music or, or, or sport or academic subjects, and behavior. And behavior is simply a series of habits, aptitudes, attitudes, but also knowledge uh, and, and so on that, that can be learned. And so once you realize that, then the principles can apply to behavior too. So things like, you know, revising the behavior you learned in the previous lesson, uh, insisting upon a high level of compliance, making sure that you demonstrate your behavior a lot. You know, it sounds obvious, but I'll tell you what, it wasn't obvious to me when I started. And I'm happy to tease it out into absurd, super obviousness if it helps yeah. teachers, you know? No, I think that's, I think, I, I, I think that's exactly the chance of my experience of talking about things. Yeah. It, it's things like the daily review, weekly, monthly, really reminding them, um, scaffolding, making it easy to do, um, you know, and high success rate all these things they just absolutely apply and you know checking for understanding which is exactly you know do you understand what i'm saying yeah. so i i i think that's great i i think you know we're coming up to the end there it's uh 25 past seven i i, I think oh. um a couple of questions people have asked on, on the chat one of them is um when is the book out so fundamentally people are going to be eager to buy it. <laughs> well it's like the 28th i was supposed to be four or five days ago but as i said before um it's uh yeah it was, it was slightly delayed by the editing process but that's as much my fault as anything else so if you can just hang on for another nine days i'll get one the same day everyone else does i think yeah okay fantastic well <laughs> that, that's really good to look forward to i have to say this I'm, i mean i i think um you know pe people often i don't know you get referred to because of the the role that you've played as an advisor and so on assuming things about what you say and I having been present when you've done training I, I often feel yeah. like people don't fully get the complexity the nuance the the the, the, you know, the subtlety of the, of the message that you're giving and I think the book really captures that superbly well and uh, thank you I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of it and I, I I really think it's that sort of thing where you know you've got some NQTs or some experience teachers put it in their hand it's going to really help um, so honestly congratulations I think it's thank you Tom I'm much appreciated I really really mean that I think it's a, it's a superb book um, and I'm looking forward to people talking all about it because as soon as it's out, people will just be loving it and sharing it. So look, well done. And um, thank you for joining us for this chat this evening. Thank you, Tom. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. Can't yeah. believe you give thank up you crazy people. Thank you to everyone who's been with us. And what we're going to do is we'll, there'll be, this is recorded and people who registered for the, for the session will you'll, we'll send you the link and you yeah. can put it to your, to your heart's content and to your friends. So look, thanks for joining us this evening. Thanks very much to Tom. Congratulations. Uh, thanks to, uh, I'm going to say thanks to Annabelle from John Cat and to the John Cat team for working Where with us. Uh, John Cat. Lovely people. Lovely that people. Those lovely people. Eh? <laughs> okay, so thanks very much, everyone. And good best wishes to you, Tom. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Take care. Good night.